Otis Redding was an electrifying soul singer, entertainer, businessman, husband, and father. His life was cut short in a plane crash along with six other passengers on board of his plane. They were on their way to perform a show at a venue in Madison, Wisconsin called The Factory. He was just 26 years of age. George Harrison of The Beatles said, and I quote, Redding's 1965 rendition of Respect was inspiration for The Beatles' Drive My Car, end quote. Steve Cropper said in an interview, and I quote, Otis Redding was the only singer who could make the hair on my arm stand up when he sings, end quote. In Keith Richards' autobiography, Life, Richards wrote that he didn't like satisfaction until he heard Otis do it. Redding was considered a soul singer, and he was also a songwriter, but he was already looking to expand his musical talents early in his career. His number one hit that was released after his death, sitting on the dock of the bay, was showing the growth in his musical ability. The song was written and co-written by Steve Cropper and Otis Redding. I speak more on Steve Cropper in my Albert King video. Another interesting thing about Redding, he was voted new king of the mic in September 1967 by Melody Maker's annual pop poll, which ended Elvis Presley's eight-year reign as world's best male vocalist. Within three months of this accomplishment, the rise of Otis Redding was no more. The other passengers on the plane was the pilot, Richard Frazier, and the Barquet's members, Fallon Jones, Carl Cunningham, Ronnie Caldwell, Jimmy King, and a valet, Matthew Kelly, and the only survivor of the plane crash, Ben Cauley. In this video, we will be examining the rumors surrounding this tragedy and the mysteries that followed. And I will explain why people feel that this plane crash was part of a conspiracy. And while you're here, I would like to welcome you to the House of Nostalgia. Before we get into the rumors in this video, I was a member of a Facebook conspiracy group. And I might still be a member, but I haven't been over there in at least a couple of years. It was said that Redding's death was a conspiracy. Now, I guess I should at least give you all a definition of a conspiracy and why they seem to be mostly centered around the music industry. A conspiracy is a secret plan by two or more people to do something that is harmful or illegal. An evil, unlawful, treacherous, a surreptitious plan formulated in secret by two or more persons. It's a plot. Back in the day, conspiracies was associated with a secret part of the government. But as we know today, it is mostly associated with a contract, a record contract to be exact. The conspiracy theorist feels that the record labels are evil and demonic. And if you sign a recording contract, you are selling your soul for wealth and fame. In order to keep your career going or stay on this earth, you must sacrifice another human. We'll come back to that. Phil Walden was Otis Redding's manager, and they had good chemistry and a good working relationship from what I studied. He was Redding's manager from 1959 until Redding's death in 1967. Redding was a hot commodity and was about to get into movies, and one of the rumors was that Walden had a $1 million life insurance policy on Redding. And that was a fact. 
Another was that Redding's Plane was once owned by James Brown, and it was said that Redding bought the plane from Brown. Now you have publications with a whole write-up about Redding, but failed to include this information. Then you have a few that say this is true. I cannot confirm this information. Once Brown heard of Redding studying to fly this plane and use it to carry his band, equipment, luggage, as well as bandmates, Brown was very concerned about Redding and this plane. He mentioned this in his book. Right after the crash, it was said that the police found an anti shay case on the plane full of drugs, to be specific, opium and marijuana. But it was said that the police never reported this because they didn't want to embarrass the family of the victims. Now that rumor was false. There was no anti shay case full of drugs found on that plane. It was said that Redding always carried large sums of money with him, but that day it was only $302 found in his wallet, along with two checks adding up to $2,706.25. Was he carrying a large sum of money that day? You can only go by what was reported. If money was taken, and no one seen them take it, then it cannot be confirmed. Who was flying the plane? It was speculated that Redding was flying the plane, and that's false. Yes, Redding wanted to learn to fly his own plane, but the pilot, Richard Frazier, was flying the plane. And another thing, the National Transportation and Safety Board records of this flight was destroyed in 1977. Now that's what was said, but the police report of the accident is still available. Otis Ray Redding Jr. was born in Dawson, Georgia on September the 9th, 1941. He was just two years old when his family moved to Macon, Georgia. He got his start singing and playing the guitar and piano in church. Redding took singing and drum lessons and performed in his high school band. He started listening to Little Richard and Sam Cooke. And at the age of 15, he quit school and worked to help take care of his family. He joined the Upsetters in the late 50s. This was a band that once backed Little Richard. In the later part of 1958, he joined the Pine Steppers, which was Johnny Jenkins' band. By 1962, Redding was signed to Stack Records and recorded his first hit, These Arms of Mine. His first album was released a couple of years later, named Pain in My Heart. In 1965, he recorded Otis Blue, Otis Redding Sings Soul, and the hits just kept coming. With Respect, I've Been Loving You So Long, Satisfaction, Tramp. In all, Redding recorded six classic albums before his death. He was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 1989. He was inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame in 1994, and he got a Grammy for a Lifetime Achievement Award in 1999. Redding's plane was a twin-engine Beechcraft H-18. This particular plane that he owned was an older model plane, and the battery power in this plane was low. This wasn't a secret. It was known by the pilot, the mechanic, and Redding. I found this to be very strange that this wasn't a concern, especially to the pilot and mechanic. Richard Frazier only had his license for a multi-engine plane just 10 months before this crash. And I don't find that to be alarming because 
He was a former Air Force pilot. The only person instinct that kicked in about this plane was James Brown. Redding was moving different in the music industry. He was a young black man with a 300 acre ranch called the Big Old Ranch, and he owned his own private plane. I believe this was only the beginning for him. He was running his career like a business. A lot of black blues and rock and roll artists from the early 50s had to survive on a hustler mentality. They had recognition only, but no money because the record company was scamming their money. That's why a lot of them died broke, but it was different for Redding. He understood the business side of the entertainment industry. James Alexander was the only member of the Bar K's that was not on that plane the day of the crash. The new Bar K's with James Alexander became a successful funk band in the 70s, even more successful than they were in the 60s up until the mid 80s, cranking out top 10 hits on the R&B charts. Sam Cawley, the survivor of the crash, joined the band for a short period of time. It didn't seem to work out for him. Another band associated with this story that had a total glow up, and that was the Grim Reapers. They were the warm-up band who was performing while they were waiting on Redding and the Barcays. No one at this venue knew that it was a plane crash. A few years later, they changed their name to Cheap Trick. Redding had just finished recording his number one song, Sitting on the Dock of the Bay, just four days before his plane crashed into Lake Monona, becoming the first ever posthumous single to top the charts. This song sold over 4 million copies. Do I find this story to be a conspiracy? Well, if we take the record company route, it's no secret that they have always been greedy by taking artist masters to become rich and not caring about the artists or money for their families. So in this case, I would say no. His death would not have benefited the record label at all. His last song did sell over 4 million copies, but he was on the verge of being worth way more than that. If the record company was giving out devil contracts, as greedy as they seem to be, I don't believe they would cut their money that soon. Plus, Redding was not the only smart black entertainer with money in the 60s. It was a lot of black actors, sports figures, businessmen, and black publications. I mention that because it always seems to be part of the argument. Was it a plot? Well, it was no secret that the plane was faulty. This was known before the flight. The weather wasn't good either. Redding wasn't a pilot or a mechanic. He was a businessman and entertainer. So for the people in charge of the safety of this plane to shrug off the danger and flying it will always be the biggest mystery of this story and the talent that the world missed out on because of it. All of these mysterious events, along with what could have been, is what make this story of a legend still being told 56 years later. But it's always another theory. Feel free to tell me what you think about this story in the comment section below. I would love to hear from you. Thanks for watching the video.